Liebe Gäste, sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen hier im Körperforum. Ich freue mich, dass Sie so zahlreich erschienen sind und ich begrüße auch ganz herzlich alle Gäste, die uns im Livestream zuschauen. Ich bin Elisabeth von Hammerstein, ich bin Programmleiterin hier bei der Körperstiftung und arbeite im Bereich internationale Politik und beschäftige mich unter anderem mit Themen des Wert Europas, worüber wir heute sprechen werden. Ich ich glaube, ich kann sagen, dass das Thema des heutigen Abends aktueller nicht wirklich sein könnte. Ungarn war in den letzten Tagen, in den letzten Wochen sehr viel in den Medien. Sie verdienen zu erfahren, was Brüssel tun will, hieß es und heißt es in Riesenlettern auf einem Plakat, auf dem der Präsident der EU-Kommission Jean-Claude Juncker und der ungarisch-amerikanische Milliardär George Soros zu sehen sind. Die ungarische Regierung hat ähm, unter anderem auf ihrer Facebook-Seite noch näher ausgeführt, Brüssels Migrationsanreizpläne würden die Sicherheit Ungarns fundamental bedrohen. Jean-Claude Juncker, selbst Mitglied der Europäischen Volkspartei, hat nun den Ausschluss der Fidesz-Partei aus der Europäischen Volkspartei gefordert die Familie der christdemokratischen Parteien. Fides sagt er, vertrete die christdemokratischen Werte in keinerlei Weise, so hat er letzte Woche gesagt. Es gibt zwischen Herrn Orban und mir keinerlei Schnittmengen. Daher ist er der Meinung, dass sein Platz nicht in der Europäischen Volkspartei ist, der Platz von Herrn Orban. Der Spitzenkandidat der EVP, Manfred Weber, setzt dahingegen mehr auf Mäßigung des ungarischen Regierungschefs. Darüber und über vieles mehr wollen wir heute Abend reden. Wir wollen darüber sprechen, was die ungarische Regierung mit dieser jüngsten Plakatkampagne bezwecken möchte. Aber wir wollen auch vor allen Dingen darüber sprechen, wo Ungarn seine Rolle in der Europäischen Union sieht. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass wir dafür ein deutsch-ungarisches Panel äh, gewinnen konnten unter dem, unter dem Titel Feindbild Brüssel, Ungarn und die EU werden wir diskutieren, wo Ungarn seine Rolle in der EU sieht und welche Visionen Budapest für die Zukunft des europäischen Projekts hat. Bevor ich Ihnen unsere zwei Gäste näher vorstelle, möchte ich noch zwei Worte sagen zu unserer Arbeit bei der Körperstiftung. Im Handlungsfeld internationale Verständigung beschäftigen wir uns jetzt besonders für die nächste Zeit mit dem sogenannten Wert Europas. Wir möchten eine, einen Beitrag zur Debatte anstoßen über die Vergangenheit, die Gegenwart und die Zukunft des europäischen Projekts und dabei unser Augenmerk besonders darauf richten, wie eine neue Spaltung Europas unter anderem entlang des ehemaligen Eisernen Vorhangs, aber auch geografisch anders ähm, vermieden werden kann. In diesem Sinne freue ich mich ganz besonders, heute unsere beiden Gäste begrüßen zu dürfen. Dr. Judith Wager ist seit Juni 2018 die Staatsministerin für EU-Beziehungen im Büro des ungarischen Ministerpräsidenten. Sie hat vorher fast neun Jahre lang für unterschiedliche Abgeordnete im Europäischen Parlament gearbeitet und ist von ihrer Ausbildung her Juristin, mit Summa Cum Laude Abschluss habe ich gelesen, hat einige Zeit in internationalen Kanzleien bei Freshfields Bruckhaus Deringer und bei Hogan und Hartzen gearbeitet, ähm, sowie am Hauptstädtischen Gericht in Budapest. Und das muss ich sagen, weil wir hier in Deutschland, oder das möchte ich sagen, weil wir hier in Deutschland sind, sie hat einige Zeit äh, auch mit einem Erasmus-Stipendium an der Fachhochschule Nürtingen studiert, und zwar European Studies. Sie versteht und spricht also auch ziemlich gut Deutsch, aber wir werden die Diskussion heute auf Englisch führen. Und neben Deutsch spricht sie außerdem auch noch in Brüssel gelernt Französisch und Spanisch. Eine wahre Europäerin, möchte ich fast sagen. Unser zweiter Gast, Thorsten Benner, kommt aus Berlin. Er ist der Mitbegründer und Direktor des Global Public Policy Institutes, eines unabhängigen Think Tanks und unterrichtet außerdem an der Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. Er setzt sich viel und arbeitet viel zum Zusammenwirken von Westmächten und nicht westlichen Staaten in der internationalen Gemeinschaft 
und war unter anderem auch Berater des Gründungsteams der School of Public Policy an der Central European University in Budapest. Dafür hat er mir gerade gesagt, ist er ungefähr vier Jahre nach Budapest äh, gependelt. Thorsten Benner hat Politikwissenschaft, Geschichte und Soziologie an der Universität Siegen, der University of York und der University of California in Berkeley studiert und war von 2001 bis 2003 McCloy Fellow an der Harvard Kennedy School, wo er einen Master in öffentlicher Verwaltung absolviert hat. Und wie wahrscheinlich auch einige von Ihnen wissen, schreibt er regelmäßig Artikel zu unterschiedlichen Themen, aber auch zu Ungarns Politik in internationalen und deutschen Medien. Das Gespräch wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Wenn Sie kein Englisch verstehen, dann würde ich Sie bitten, die Kopfhörer aufzusetzen oder meine Kolleginnen noch nach Kopfhörern zu fragen. Ansonsten bleibt mir nichts weiter übrig, als unsere Gäste zu willkommen zu heißen. Please join me in welcoming Judith Wager und Thorsten Benner. So this is, it's time for me to switch to English. A warm welcome to both of you. It's great to have you here in Hamburg. And I would like to start off uh, with you, Judith Wager, and ask you about uh, the past. <laughs> I um, would like to ask you, I know that in 2003 you returned from Nürtingen back to Budapest, as far as I know. And um, in 2004, you and all of us witnessed uh, the Hungarian EU accession. And I wanted to ask you, is there still, is there still a moment or some, some time of the year that you remember about uh, that particular EU accession of, of Hungary in 2004? Thank you very much. Uh, good Abend. Uh, ich freue mich sehr, dass ich hier äh, an diesem Paneldiskussion teilnehmen kann, obwohl ich jeder Sprache äh, sehr viel liebe, wage ich es nicht, äh, in diesem Debatte auf äh, Deutsch teilzunehmen. Also erlauben Sie mir bitte auf Englisch äh, sprechen. Äh, ein paar Worte, ich liebe Hamburg, das bedeutet für mich äh, die Liebe, weil mein Mann hier studierte mit Erasmus Stipendium in 2002, bevor ich sie äh, kennengelernt äh, hatte. So thank you for the question, because of course 2004, uh, 15 years ago, marked a very precious moment in our lives, uh, because we finally, legally, also could join the club where, to which we always belonged, because we always emphasized that Hungary has a hundred uh, thousand years history, thousand and hundred years history, and always belonged to uh, ideologically, uh, historically, to the core values of Europe. And, uh, Unfortunately, there were certain decades in history where we were legally not allowed and politically not allowed to be part of this uh, club, to this uh, community. So 2004 was not only a technical uh, moment in time when uh, all these uh, Eastern member states or Central European ex-socialist communist member states could finally uh, get rid of uh, the past and enter a new era. So that time I actually graduated from the University of Law in Miskolc. This is the second, uh, now already just the third largest city of Hungary. And um, I do be remember the moment when I was in Geislingen an der Steige, because I just finished my Erasmus uh, uh, in 2004, the, the February, because I had this between 2003 and 2004. And uh, the professor told me that you have to try to get uh, out to Brussels because that's come nie wieder. That's what he told me, that uh, this uh, opportunity for us uh, newly uh, joined member states, uh, this is a good opportunity when we can uh, go to Brussels and to work for the European Union. And that time, uh, thanks to some personal private grants, I actually decided to start my legal career as a trainee lawyer at Fresh Facebook House Deringer. But somehow life uh, made it me uh, possible uh, a couple of years later, uh, especially five years later, to have the opportunity to work in the office of Mr. Janos Ader, who was that time a uh, member of the European Parliament, uh, delegated from the Fidesz uh, party, 
and uh, so he is now the president of Hungary, but uh, when he was uh, elected to be president, I actually decided to stay in Brussels because uh, I wanted to integrate more into Western societies and really learn about their thoughts, their mentality, and really get to know the, the average uh, Belgian citizen and the average Western European citizen there. And I had a wonderful nine-year uh, period in Brussels. All my children were uh, scholarized in, in Belgian local schools. Uh, so I, that's how I actually uh, had the chance also to, to have a real experience there. So you said that you wanted to learn about the mentality of, of uh, Brussels. What, um, if, if you had to describe uh, the relationship of Hungary, and you work for the Hungarian government now, but uh, you used to work in Brussels for a long time, if you had to describe the relationship as of now in three words, what would they be? The relationship of whom? Hungary and the European Union. Oh, very vivid. Vivid, okay. Um, let's say uh, very, very interesting and a uh, lot of potential. A <laughs> lot of potential for the, for the future of Europe. Uh huh. And very relevant, let's say. Okay, relevant. Okay. So relevant, a lot of potential, and of course, tense and interesting, okay. as always. <laughs> That's, that's very positive, I have to say. <laughs> um, so I, I need to ask you, I mean, from the outside, you sometimes get, or you, especially today, you get the perception that uh, Hungary and the European Union are not the best friends. I don't want to say enemies, maybe something in between, frenemies. Um, how did we get to this point? Wow. Okay, um, let's uh, come up with some statistical data. According to the latest barometer uh, poll, uh, the Hungarians' enthusiasm towards the European project is nearly 70%, so one of the highest among the European Union citizens. So, uh, and also as our national credo says uh, in our uh, constitution, that Hungarians are very proud that uh, through our fights in our history, we always defended the values of Europe and we enriched this value. So uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, we have to see the ding an sich. So let's say the, the facts and uh, let's see the real uh, relations between uh, our uh, individuals, our uh, policy makers. I think if you look at the, the facts, we have so many fruitful cooperation, we have so many pro-European uh, activity, what we carry out, that you really uh, need to be very precise when, when you believe what you read in the press about, about the relationship, uh, the so-called relationship between Hungary and Brussels. And let me just finish my answer with a personal story. We celebrated our 10th uh, anniversary of our marriage with my husband. We were sitting in a fine Brussels restaurant and we were talking in, in Hungarian. And there was a very nice couple sitting next to us, a Belgian couple. And uh, after half an hour, they dared to ask, what kind of language are you speaking? Because it's so, so different of everything. And, and we said, oh, it's Hungarian. And they said, oh, you are Hungarians, but you are not so, so böse like that, that, like that Orban Viktor. And, you know, that time my husband was a diplomat for the Hungarian government in the permanent representation. I was working for the Fidesz uh, delegation in the European Parliament. So we said, okay, but we are working for this man in Brussels. And then we started a very, very good discussion. It lasts for one hour. At, at the end of this discussion, we had quite a lot of common ground and a lot of common issues. So that's why actually I was so happy to accept my appointment when my minister called me in May after the elections in April that now you can come home and you can do what you always did when you were a private person in Brussels, actually talking to the individuals and trying to dissolve any kind of misconceptions and misunderstandings because actually it hurt me personally. And this is a personal issue for me. And uh, that's why I always have to make it clear that uh, if you look at uh, the facts, uh, like let's make, give, give an example, the, the defense policy. Hungary is always there for the uh, enrichment and enhancing uh, the common defense policy of Europe. But we can also say uh, that uh, in the big elephant in the room issue, the migration, 
Hungary was uh, the first country to have a very straightforward, very honest, very direct opinion already back in 2015 and uh, making a clear position that we would like to defend the Schengen achievement. We would like to comply with our commitments and obligations under Schengen and uh, we would like to be just true Europeans by, by uh, committed, to be committed uh, for the security of the whole uh, zone. So, um, but I could also quote other examples. We'll, we'll come to both issues that unite uh, the, some of the European member states and that also divide them in a minute. Um, but I would like to, to stick, uh, to come back to the issue of, or to, to the year of 2004 and ask you, Torsten Benner, um, according to our latest results of a poll that we do once a year for the Berlin Pulse, our annual publication, um, we ask German about, um, about the EU Eastern enlargement of 2004 and what Germans think about that. And I thought it was quite remarking that f remarkable that 46% of Germans consider EU, the EU Eastern enlargement of 2004 to be a mistake, while 47 consider it to be the right decision. So what is your explanation of that? What do you make out of this number? First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's great uh, that Körper Foundation is putting this debate on, on an issue I'm very passionate about. I love Budapest, I love Hungary, and I always enjoy spending time there and I deeply care about the relations between Germans and Hungarians and about Hungary's place in Europe. And I'm grateful you made the time, Minister Varga, to, uh, to come. Now, now to the, to, you, asked, you asked me about this figure. I find it a very disconcerting figure. 46% of Germans are actually have buyer's remorse and, uh, and think it was a mistake to enlarge the European uh, European Union. I think it's a very disconcerting figure because we should be very proud uh, that uh, we now live in a community of values and freedom in Europe and that we actually managed to bring those countries in that uh, by an historical accident uh, weren't allowed to live in freedom from 1945 onwards. So we should be very proud, proud of it. But I think the number reflects two things. Maybe on the one hand, a lack of political discussion on the value of actually having this kind of common European space uh, and all the problems that come with it if you live in a common Euro European space and uh, you have different opinions. On the other hand, it probably also reflects the tensions uh, that uh, we have with some of the newly joined members. Uh, and often, and I don't want to have today's debate as one of the arrogant Germans who know what it is to be a good European lecturing the Hungarians uh, and telling them what a good European should look like and, and so on. We sometimes have that problem uh, in, in Germany. But uh, you said we need to talk about the facts, and I think there is a problem with the fact that your Prime Minister, who had a traumatic experience before Hungary actually joined the European Union in 2002, uh, he lost power after being four years uh, one of the youngest Prime Ministers uh, in the history of Hungary, he lost power in 2002. It's not a funny experience to lose power, so he resolved, once he got back to power, that this should never happen again. For this purpose, Mr. Orban decided to build something he calls an illiberal state based on national foundations within the, uh, within the heart of the European Union. Now, we need to have a discussion whether an illiberal state on national foundations, according to the way it has been designed by Mr. Orban, he, and he has been very methodic about it. Uh, he announced it in 2014. And even before he took steps, because uh, Hungary drew up a whole new constitution from scratch, uh, rammed it through parliament uh, with a two-third majority, and they've done everything you need to do to build an illiberal state that actually makes it close to impossible to be voted out of office again. You pack the courts, uh, you change the voting uh, rules in order to make it less advantageous for the, for the opposition. You make sure you control the media. About 90% of media in Hungary are, are now con controlled by, by Mr. Orban and uh, his cronies. Uh, you 
put controls on academia. Uh, Central European University is one story, but also all the universities in Hungary now have controls from, the, from the, a, a chancellor that has been installed uh, by the government that has, has a lot of, uh, that has a lot of controls. You do all these, you do all these things, uh, you do all these things to make, make it very, very hard for opposition parties, and when they come up, opposition parties, you go after them with financial, uh, with uh, financial instruments, the tax authorities, and, and so on. You don't need to use violence in order to make sure that nobody kind of votes you, uh, votes you out of office. You can do, you can do all these things calmly, timidly. You can oil your machinery of oligarchs uh, that you have, and you can use European Union funds. That's the genius of Mr. Orban. He's the most talented politician I think we have in in, in Europe uh, these days. You can then use European Union funds to actually, uh, you know, make sure that the, the people close to your party uh, get uh, all the contracts uh, they need, and you can make sure that uh, Brussels, uh, which he considers the new Moscow, is also the wonderful bogeyman that you can rail against. Uh, and then you have Mr. Soros, and then you can have this kind of permanent state of emergency in, in public debate, where you think that Europe is overran by migrants, we're losing Christianity, we're losing culture, and we're the last warriors standing to fight for this, uh, to fight for this in Europe. And he has been mightily successful, and we've been just bystanders in this whole game, because uh, German companies have played uh, their game, they're operating incredibly profitably. The uh, German Christian Democrats and Christian Socialists uh, who are in bed uh, with Fidesz in the European People's Party have done nothing, and uh, all the mechanisms we have in the European Union have proven toothless uh, in, in order to do something against this project of an illiberal state uh, at the heart of uh, the European, European projects. And we should take lessons from that, that it's actually fairly easy to pursue this project, that uh, within the European Union we don't have good mechanisms to go against this, and that Mr. Orban in many ways, uh, in addition to Pish and Mr. Kaczynski, they're pioneers, and now you have these illiberal state projects kind of springing up everywhere. 2014, when Mr. Orban declared this, we could have still done something about it. It would have meant something to kind of shove him out of the European People's Party, because he could have joined a, a very, very sad troop of Farage and, and, and so on, and, and others. Now, Mr. Orban has the opportunity after the European elections, he can build a grand alliance with Mr. Kaczynski, with Mr. Salvini, and can, can really, it's a, really a force for this kind of illiberal state project that has kind of gained steam. So I think it should be a cautionary tale for all of us how easy it is uh, to move from a full-fledged democracy to something that now you can only consider a hybrid regime that's somewhere between democracy and uh, autocracy. Freedom House downgraded Hungary as the first country within the European Union recently to partly, to partly free. You don't need to believe in these rankings, but if you look at all the indicators for liberal, liberal democracy, and Mr. Orban proudly says so, Hungary doesn't meet them uh, these days. So I think we should draw the, the right lessons from this experience. Before I give it back to you, Judith Vaga, now I need to push you a little bit more. So what are the right lessons? So what exactly did Germany and other EU member states do wrong? I mean, what, what, what did we do wrong? I mean, we didn't do anything, right? What, what did we do? I mean, uh, German business has profited mightily from investments in Hungary. And Hungary is a wonderful place to do business. Uh, great workforce, skilled, uh, logistically well, well located. So I can understand why BMW uh, is putting a billion into a new factory, why Daimler is producing there, why Bosch is producing there and uh, why other Audi is, uh, is, is producing there. But I would have hoped that uh, instead of Mr. Uh, that uh, the head of government uh, relations of, of Daimler, Mr. von Kleden, 
I think it was in 2017 he did a big meeting with Mr. Orban in Budapest and said, like, my friend, and, and so on, and uh, he kind of praised the Hungarian government instead of saying that European Union is not just a community of a joint economic space, but we're also a community of political values, and uh, you should clearly express your opinion if things go wrong. And uh, the, the, the second responsibility, I think, uh, lies with, uh, ch with Chancellor Merkel and uh, the party, because unfortunately it's the case in the European Union uh, that what a researcher, Daniel Kellerman, calls the authoritarian equilibrium. The European Parliament has become more important uh, in relative terms over the past 10 years. But that makes it less likely for the, for the party groups to actually reign in their members if their governments go rogue. Uh, that, that applies to both socialists. Uh, the socialist, uh, social democrats have a hard time looking if things go wrong in Romania. And uh, that, but also applies to European People's Party that has, has turned a blind eye to what's going on in, in Hungary. And Mr. Weber, who is now the Spitzenkandidat, uh, I mean, he said last year uh, that if you infringe academic freedom, that's really a red line. And uh, now, Mr. Orban managed to get Central European University out of Budapest, so he trampled, he gently trampled over Mr. Weber's red line. And what happened? Nothing. Now, we'll see what happens, uh, what, what happens now, but it almost doesn't matter what happens now because it's, uh, it's almost too late because... Mr. Orban has so many other options uh, right now. Maybe it's even great for Mr. Orban to be kicked out of EPP and to start, to start a new movement and uh, not to have to bother with, uh, with all the kind of pettiness and uh, your, your, your boss traveled, uh, traveled to, uh, to Berlin on Tuesday to see uh, Annegret kamp karrenbauer and to have, uh, have this constant back and forth, uh, whether you can stay in or out. Uh, maybe Mr. Orban is quite pleased uh, if he kind of gets ejected and he can say, I stood up uh, for Christianity, I stood up for my values against migrants, against Soros. They kicked me out because they sold out to Soros and uh, he's the puppet master. And here I stand with Salvini and Kaczynski for a strong Europe and strong Christianity and uh, the real Christian democracy in Europe. It's not a bad line uh, if, if I had to kind of spin it. Judith Varga, I would like to ask you, there are many, many issues which we can discuss now, but I would like to start off by asking you about um, the liberal new state built on national foundations that Thorsten Benner mentioned. What exactly, can you, could you please enlighten us, what exactly uh, does this mean and um, how does this go together with the founding principles and values of the European Union? Wow, thank you very much. I think so many issues were touched up on that. I just, uh, if I start to talk now, maybe you have to ask for some uh, food uh, <laughs> to survive my answer. I, I will make sure to interrupt you on time. I, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, getting into the media stress. Uh, so getting into the middle of, of issues. However, I'm trying to feel myself as a a minority to be defended in this room. So in the name of uh, European values, I think I'm, I'm belonging to now a uh, minority. So uh, let's uh, start by, uh, by a statement, uh, not lecturing uh, each other. Uh, however, I still have a slight feeling of uh, lecturing uh, us. And uh, when it comes to the issues which were just uh, listed uh, so longly and uh, with all the determination that everything is going wrong in my country, let me just, just give me some possibility to try to uh, fine-tune this and uh, just refuse all these criticism. I think uh, what we are witnessing now is the same why I'm actually so happy to be in the position where I am today, because it is uh, the so-called Sargantini method for me like uh, listing all the press releases and uh, listing the titles, what we read in the news, and uh, starting by the misunderstanding of the illiberal democracy, because we all can agree on that democracy in Europe is the, the basic uh, uh, form of functioning of a state, because it comes from the demos, it means that uh, the power, the primary power lies in the hands of the people, 
and in the hands of the electorate. And I'm going to elaborate on this uh, uh, phenomenon further because I will also give you my reply about Hungary's vision on the European Union, which is actually also deducted being close to the people, like uh, to be in line with the people's will when you are governing your country. And uh, the illiberal, the word illiberal, uh, it does not in any event mean that uh, uh, the functioning of the state is against the civil liberties, like the human rights or all those uh, issues which are always misunderstood in Brussels. They say that with uh, declaring illiberal democracy, you are declaring the end of the, the human rights world. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's a character of a democracy which we don't want to follow because it means that we should follow the pattern of the good old liberal methods of uh, functioning of our economies. For example, not uh, being brave enough to defend our small and medium enterprises. We had a very good example when we tried to have a differentiation in the taxation uh, just uh, to have uh, better economic op opportunities for the smaller and medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises instead of the good old recipe of uh, having a big liberal economy where uh, everything can just be flooded uh, from outside on your country, then we were, of, of course, uh, having an infringement procedure because of that. So in any event, it means the liberal democracy that uh, it is uh, against something uh, democratic or something value issue. It's just like making or walking our own way when we are uh, organizing the functioning of our state based on true values of Europe and, of course, all democracies all over the world, which are... <laughs> Thank you. So, and then you I don't seem to be the minority. Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you um, but uh, actually, when it comes to the to the history, because you mentioned that uh, there was uh, the 2002 uh, the electoral defeat, and then in 2010, Prime Minister Orbán came into power with a landslide two-third victory, thanks to free and democratic elections. I was that time in Brussels, and I saw that actually the Western world in which I was in, on the edge of integrating into, actually, so to really get to know them, how they think, I saw them that they were actually frightened and threatened that how come that in a democratic and free election one political party can gain such a big majority? And since then they are always questioning, well, there, is, there are some doubts, how could you gain this two-third majority? But this was the electorate's will. This is pure democracy in Hungary. Uh, so I would like to just ask you to, to respect uh, the decision of the Hungarian people, which is now in a row the third time, because after 2010, Mr. Orban already won twice with the two-third uh, majority. This is how democracy functions in Europe, and yes, it can be possible if you are a successful government, pushing down the unemployment rate to 3.3, .3, to have a GDP uh, uh, increase of 4.4, .4, to to have a switch from the allowance-based society to the labor-based society and to bring back the respect for labor in the society. And then you're also showing results because also our wages have increased with 60% in the last eight years. And I could also say about the, the facts again, then that's how voters actually uh, make the decision when they go to the polls. So uh, put this into a different framework, like having some doubts, uh, some uh, illiberal threats to Europe from the East. I just invite you to spend more time again in Budapest and uh, try to live there to pay your taxes and then you can really feel uh, who we are. And it is a, a sound and uh, well-functioning democracy. One great man told me today, a German uh, well-known politician that uh, uh, he knows the Hungarians uh, and uh, he thinks that there are three points where we are different. And maybe that's why we are not so well understood. Like our language is the first, because of course in Europe the Hungarian language is the odd one out. Uh, it is, it is uh, um, very uh, difficult for anyone to, to understand. The second one, we are uh, the nation in, in the European Union who actually has a real experience what it means when you are living under uh, Osman oppression. So we have lived together for many, many years in our history uh, with a different culture and we had our experience. 
and all our actions in the present, they are just in line with this historic experience. So we know what we are talking about when we give our adequate answers to the challenges of today. So it is very, very important. And the third and last one, which is very, very important, and I always emphasize it when we have the anniversaries of our freedom fights, like the 56th revolution or the 48, 1848, freedom fights at Hungary has always, also like other Central European countries, had, had always had to fight for the freedom. So for us, freedom and the free democracy is a precious heritage, which we always have to keep in mind that we always had to fight for it, not just got it. Uh, so these are, I think, three uh, main characters of Hungarians, why we have a different mentality in politics, why we are straightforward, why we are brave. And that's also, um, let me add that uh, after our 15 years of experience being a member of the club, all what we do is just using the rules of the game, what we learned. We, we are, I think, I think, even more and more successful uh, in behaving as a member state. It means we use the laws and the legal possibilities provided for us by the treaties to form alliances. For example, this is the success of the V4 countries. We don't do anything else what the other old member states are always doing, forming alliances for the sake of the common success. So, uh, and this is how things started to, to go wrong, because when you form your alliances and you really realize your interests and you give an adequate political answer to that, if it does not fit the accession scenario, which I call accession scenario, that uh, in 2004 we were embraced by Europe, but there was always this lecturing module. Like, you little children, now you are embraced by the big uh, adult, but you are not grown enough, grown up enough uh, to, to have a proper democracy. I, I felt this every day in Brussels. And of course, as a Hungarian, you got used to it, but it does not mean that uh, you won't defend your national interest when you are sitting at the negotiating table in Brussels. And when uh, you are a bit out of the mainstream, because being a member of the club, it does, necessarily, not, not, does not necessarily mean that you have to speak the mainstream, then uh, conflicts may start. So uh, <laughs> let me just really shortly react on, the, on these accusations, like the Central European University, Everyone can come to Budapest and can see with the eyes that there is the Hungarian accredited Central European University working and actually uh, recruiting students for the next school year all over in Budapest. So it is not true that the CU uh, went away or it was chased away. It is still operating in Budapest. So many things were mentioned, but uh, <laughs> let me just come back shortly to this. Uh, CDU and EPP issue, Fidesz has always been a faithful member party of the whole EPP. And like in any big families, there are, there are a lot of members and there are internal problems and discussions, but we were always there safeguarding the core values of that uh, People's Party, which means Christian values, Judeo-Christian roots of Europe, being brave enough to, to declare this, a party which stands by the people. Because what we see in Europe, that the elite is actually detached from the people, from the reality. Because uh, the elite is uh, uh, putting in place measures. The best uh, example is for that, the migration. However, that is clear from all uh, the polls, even the European uh, polls prove it that the first and primary concern of a European citizen is migration and the security issue which is linked to the migration. And uh, it was the first government in, in the European Union, the Hungarian government, who dared to ask this question uh, from the uh, people that, what do you think about migration? And uh, we had 2.3 uh, or, or 4 million replies. So we can really base our policies on the electorate wheel, unlike uh, other European countries. So uh, we, would, uh, we will work for the success of the European People's Party, because Fidesz is one of the most successful delegations of it, and uh, we are always a faithful member of it. And we would keep uh, the family problems internally. Thank you very much.
this was a very, uh, very comprehensive answer uh, to a lot of points that had been raised before. But I, I have to admit, I still have. I still have a hard time, and I might be, it, it might be just me, but I, I don't understand to what extent, uh, sometimes you said that Hungary belongs to the European family, and then at other times you said that there is the Western world, and you learn to be part of it, but you're not as Hungary. And then you talked about the, the Christian values um, of, of the European, or of, of Hungary in the European Union. I, to be honest, I just don't see to what extent that is right now, that is a family as a whole, um, where there are common values. When, when I think about the issue of migration, for example, another European value that, um, that is being emphasized by all member states is, is the issue of solidarity. And um, there are migrants that have come to Europe. And um, I, I completely see that there, is, um, that, there, that there are national concerns from the Hungarian side. But um, how, how does this go together? I think uh, the short answer is uh, the motto of the European Union, unity in diversity. Einheit in der Vielfalt. So it's, it's very, very important to, to keep in mind that what was the the motto what we joined uh, when, when we joined the European Union, when we signed the treaties, when we uh, actually accepted the legal framework, this was the motto. It means that 50% diversity is also justified. And what we see that there is this forced unification of Europe. Hungary always believed in a strong Europe. This was the motto of our presidency back in 2011. And uh, we only need more Europe when it is well justified, when it respects that framework which the treaties provide. And uh, if you uh, look at the Hungarian politics from this uh, perspective, from this motto, we, only, uh, we are striving for a Europe which respects the differences, respects the nation states or the states or the sovereign states, which are working together successfully with mutual respect. And it means that some member parties should not, not be punished just having a different opinion from that of the mainstream. And when it comes to the solidarity in migration, uh, is, it, is it not a big solidarity when you are spending a lot of efforts and money to defend the Schengen zone, which is not only for the sake of Hungary's security, but for the security of all Europe? And the benefits of this measure, which has been so highly criticized by, the, uh, by many politicians and, and many in Europe proved to be a very effective tool. And this is, this is also solidarity, and it should be also respected. So I, I don't uh, see any kind of uh, um, lack of solidarity here. But it is crystal clear in migration, in Europe, we can never have a, a compromise which will be good for everyone. We only need tolerance, patience, and respect. Because Hungary never criticized any other member state for taking off many, many uh, millions of uh, migrants or inviting them with further measures. Hungary only, <laughs> Hungary only wanted, yes, let's get back to 2015. We had a very correct answer to what we said. We have our historical experience. We see how it is going. We see the trends outside of Europe, the population trends, our answer to any kind of demographic uh, crisis of Europe is not migration, is not inviting of many, many millions, it's not bringing the problem to Europe, it's bringing the help locally. That's why we believe in development policy. That's why we also set up a Hungarian program, Hungary Helps, which uh, puts many uh, million euros into locally uh, safeguard those uh, uh, communities so that they are not forced to leave their countries. So this is our part in this common European issue, which is a challenge for all of us. But we only ask for respect, nothing else. And uh, it is not, uh, I do hope that our critics are liberal in a meaning, really liberal, meaning that, uh, that they are open towards other ideas. Because uh, we have a completely different view about the future of Europe. We joined a framework where it was the respect and the cooperation of member states, not having a supranational centrist body. And of course, these are diverging or, or confronting uh, theories, 
but it is also justified in the name of diversity to have this view and not to be sanctioned and stigmatized before the different view. This is the only thing. Charles. Thank you. From, from your perspective, how do these very different visions of the European Union go together? Look, I agree <clears throat> that the arrogance and the primary mechanism by which accession countries and new members were treated was that of expected imitation. They were supposed to imitate the ways of the established members, and that breeds resentment. And especially if this imitation goes beyond just the rules of the game that we set in the European Union to cut more cultural expectations uh, of, about how much diversity you should have in a, in a society. What the percentage of uh, citizens that are not born in a country is, that's nowhere said in the European Union. And nobody has a right to tell any country you should uh, open your borders and uh, let more citizens uh, in for humanitarian reasons, for other reasons, and, and so on. And Hungary has every right to say, you know, uh, people got very upset recently when Mr. Orban announced that he actually puts his money where his mouth is. And he, for, for women that get four children in Hungary, they get a, a, a seven-seater car for free from the government. They get, uh, a, or like a six-seater, I, 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 I can't recall. And free, but so it, uh, it's a subsidy and, uh, and a tax break and uh, otherwise, and, and with substantial amounts uh, that uh, you put your money where your mouth is. If you think that's the right policy, I think it's not for us to say this smells like uh, 1930s uh, Germany. Oh, and so which which some, some commentators said, yeah. And I think it's totally wrong to, to, to say that uh, because that's the sovereign right uh, of the government to say that and uh, the sovereign right of Hungarian women then to, to say whether they want to take the subsidy or not. Uh, now, on migration, I also agree that, uh, as I said, Hungary can decide for itself what kind of diversity it wants uh, within its borders. There are certain international obligations you have to meet in terms of the, the minimum standards when you process asylum requests. Uh, there are some issues with that that are be, being treated uh, by, by legal means in terms of what the minimum standards and whether they're being upheld uh, in Hungary, whether that was the case in 2015 or not, and is the case now. That's up to interpretation, but we have legal means to, legal means to deal with it. I think our response in 2015 was a little hypocritical, uh, or like it was not smart, I would, I would say, because uh, Mrs. Merkel has this fear, every fence is the new Berlin Wall. So when she saw this fence go up on the, on the Schengen outer border, she said like, oh, we shouldn't build new walls in Europe, that's horrible, and, 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 and so on. Whereas she should have said uh, it's okay to actually have a fence on the external Schengen border, and at the same time, do due process processing asylum uh, requests. Uh, but she should have exposed the intent of Mr. Orban, which was not necessarily protecting the external border, but to make sure that no migrants come through Hungary and they just get diverted uh, elsewhere. It was not necessarily one for the, for the European team, but he wanted to kind of get the crisis out of, out of his country first and fast, and so he built, he built this fence. He said, like, we could have said, this is a good thing in, in principle, but not at the expense of just other countries where the, the migrant flows then get diverted to. We need a more sustainable solution. That's actually ultimately the position of the German government. We came around. I mean, Mrs. Merkel has ha had a hard time acknowledging that she actually has come around quite a bit uh, in terms of border security and, and so on. And I think uh, Hungary and, and Germany don't have that many issues in, in terms of uh, external border security and how we want to secure the ex external uh, Schengen border. So I think we should learn some lessons in, in terms of uh, that this uh, conversation we had in, in 2015 on the migrant situation wasn't very smart from, from our vantage point uh, because I don't think Germans or other Europeans have the right uh, to tell Hungarians how many migrants uh, they should accept, their minimum standards in terms of processing as asylum requests, uh, and we can call out a government if it acts selfish, uh, selfishly and wants to just deflect migrant flows to other countries, we can do that, but uh, 
I think this is also not the real issue at, at the heart of this, because you asked the question, what is this illiberal state on national foundations? And you gave us the answer, hmm, I, I, I couldn't quite follow your answer, but one answer was, first of all, democracy is majoritarianism. Uh, it's the will of the people. I mean, you're, it sounded to me a little bit like democracy without Rechtsstaat. Uh, so that actually, because the will of the people, two thirds kind of gave Orban the vote, we can do whatever we, we please uh, and uh, change uh, the rules of the game. And uh, the other point was this illiberal is only on economic, in, on economic terms against a crude liberalism that prevailed in Hungary in the, in the 1990s. Liberalism, indeed, for good reason, is a bad term. Like, it's a term that's not liked by the Hungarian population these days because of these, I think, I think uh, if, I rem if I interpret this correctly, I mean, it, it resonates, Ill illiberal resonates in, in Hungary and uh, it, it is partly associated with going against a crude economic liberalism that, that you had in the 1990s. And I think Mr. Orban was smart. For example, after the financial crisis, he was very tough uh, on these reckless banks that sold Hungarians loans denominated in foreign currency, in Swiss francs and, and euros. Uh, and Mr. Orban was very tough on the banks in terms of uh, making sure that th those get converted uh, and that uh, Hungarian, Hungarians could get out of uh, these loans. So there were quite a few things that were being done wrong. But all the things I talked about that have to do with the freedom of universities, uh, media concentration, uh, packing the courts, uh, these new administrative courts that, uh, that you just uh, set up, uh, going against civil society organizations, vilifying civil society organizations in his 2014 speech, if it was all about the economy when he announced this illiberal state. He had a long passage about talking about civil society organizations. And he talked about civil society organizations. These are all paid foreign activists. And we need parliament to get to the bottom of this and uh, to look uh, and to make sure that we get behind the kind of uh, characters behind the masks that uh, kind of populate these civil society organizations. And if, the, if uh, Haaretz, the Israeli paper, says that uh, the anti-Soros campaign, I mean, Mr. Soros even uh, has the honor of, uh, of being the godfather of a law last year. Last year, Mr. Orban came up with the Stop Soros law in, uh, in, in, in Hungary. Then you can see that uh, Haaretz said that this is, uh, this is uh, plays with anti-Semitic tropes because he's a, uh, he's a fi uh, finance uh, capitalist as uh, he, he's being portrayed. Uh, and uh, and uh, you can see that this is way, goes way beyond uh, going against the excesses of uh, libertarian economics. Uh, this goes to the heart of uh, what we call Rechtsstaat. And that's why our president, uh, Mr. Steinmeier, he recently gave a speech uh, and he said, like, democracy is either liberal or it is not. And, uh, and Mr. Orban, when he met uh, Mrs. Merkel, he kind of casually said, like, well, not all democracies are like, you know, democracies don't have, to be, uh, don't have to be liberal. And I think within the European Union, democracies have to be liberal in the sense of a Rechtsstaat prevailing and all these institutions being in place and the conditions being in place that the opposition can actually gain power. Right now, the opposition in Hungary is I mean, it's a little hapless uh, and helpless, but it's also so structurally disadvantaged uh, through all the things I've uh, mentioned, including the new electoral law that makes sure that even though the voter share of uh, Fidesz goes down, it still gets uh, the two-third uh, majority, that uh, the opposition is such a structurally disadvantaged position that it hardly has a chance to gain power again, unless it actually unites, it puts up joint lists, uh, and at some point maybe elects a technical government that re uh, restores uh, the constitution and makes sure that, makes sure that uh, political competition as we know it in a liberal democracy is possible again. 
Ms. Vaga, I would like to give you the opportunity to respond, but I would also like to ask you to respond shortly because we yeah. want to open it up for the floor in a, in a few minutes. But I would um, like to, to give you the opportunity to respond, especially on, on the whole infringement proceedi proceedings that have been opened by the European Union and on the criticism about the rule of law. And you, That's as a lawyer, are, are an expert on, on law. Um, but I would also like to ask you about the Soros campaign that uh, Thorsten Benner touched upon, because um, to be very honest, I, um, I would like to understand better what or why is the Prime Minister Orban so obsessed with Soros? It's something that we don't under or that I don't understand, to be honest. Okay. Uh, and this is the last question. Not the last, <laughs> because actually I was... You, I would say you have three minutes. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I was actually preparing for a debate about Hungary's vision on the future of Europe, how to reform the European Union, and I would love to also answer questions in, in the framework of, of this uh, theory. However, it's, it's getting to be a certain criticism and uh, an alternative Article 7 procedure now on the podium. Uh, so... Uh, Maybe you can connect that... Yeah, I'm trying to connect, the because... Uh, I think uh, the biggest failure of the, the Juncker Commission was that it declared itself as a political body instead of remaining the guardian of the treaties. And what we witnessed throughout the recent years that the Commission and the European institutions, not the Council, but the European Commission and also the Court of Justice, started to have this looming enlargement of compet uh, competencies which were not conferred upon these institutions. And so uh, this is my remark because I did not want to uh, miss this uh, chance to, to say that it, this was a big failure and we would like just to remind the European Union to its roots uh, uh, and founding uh, values, which is a treaty-based uh, framework where you have shared competencies, which you confirm part of your sovereign uh, competencies on the community so that they can decide with you on these issues. And uh, this is a very clear set of issues. However, what we saw that there was this looming enlargement, like in the, in the territory of the social rights, which not uh, in any even belong to the shared competencies, but by this looming enlargement of competencies, just uh, uh, not uh, respecting the subsidiarity principle, the European uh, institution, the European Commission, started to behave as a as an, uh, sovereign, supranational, centrist body. And this is what we, we are there to, to prevent from. And this is our idea about Europe, to get back to the roots where the power lies primarily in the hands of the member states. And you asked me just uh, earlier about my my issue why I was integrated to, into the Western society so that I can also understand what you mean under concepts. Because there's a problem with the illiberal concept as well that you just proved to, to uh, you just proved what I actually mentioned before that uh, for you liberal democracy means the Rechtsstaatlichkeit. And that's what I said, that it is a misunderstanding because, of course, a democracy is a basic operational uh, form of a country in Europe where, of course, respects all the values, which also the rule of law, and also the non-discrimination, the equal treatment, the human rights, the dignity, etc. So this is the democracy for us. This is also written in our constitution. When we are talking about this uh, character of this democracy, whether it is liberal or conservative or any other uh, character, I would like to say that it is not a default value in Europe to have liberal democracy. There can be different types of democracies. It is not written in the values that as a, as a country you have to follow the liberal recipe to function, to run your state. This is, this is very important to emphasize and you just uh, said the same issue. Uh, let me just catch up. This anti-Semitism, it's so unfair. Let's be clear. Budapest is uh, the safest uh, cities uh, when it comes to uh, the everyday life of uh, our Jewish citizens. Also, many... <laughs> Anti-Semitism anti -Semitism in the rise in Europe, but not in the eastern and central part. This fact is already proved by statistical data. There is a new type of modern anti-Semitism, which is clearly interlinked to the phenomenon of migration, but you cannot read it in the press so often as you read those fake news about the Hungary and, and anti-Semitism. When it comes to George Soros, let me highlight when Mr. Soros would be attacked because of his Jewish origin, the Hungarian government would be the first to defend him. That's clear. And I would list all those uh, 
measures which the Hungarian uh, government uh, introduced in order to uh, provide a lot of uh, assistance and financial and all, all this political support for the Jewish communities to have a blue site in Budapest these days. And it is approved by many international Jewish organizations and also by the Prime Minister of Israel. So please don't go this path because it is a very narrow path and it is very, very unfair and I have to clearly refuse this. And this is the problem, and you just resonate it everywhere in the, in the Western press. People have the, uh, you know, this concept about Hungary uh, having this anti-Semitic issue, but it is not. It is not us who have this problem. The Stop Soros legislative package was a package which is actually there to defend the European borders because it is per persecuting the illegal support, intentional illegal support of illegal immigration. What it means when you are providing brochures for uh, migrants, how they can circumvent the European legislation to get an asylum. We are standing on the basis of the law. We, as you rightly mentioned, we have an infringement procedure. Yes, that is, is uh, the case. Because in the European framework, if you have a compatibility issue with your national law and the European legislation, you have the possibility to defend your position in the Court of Justice or with the European Commission. So it is still an open issue. and. Uh, we are uh, standing on the international treaties. We are defending our position legally. We have very good lawyers in the Justice Ministry. So let's, let's see what is the end of this story. But it is an, an ongoing procedure, so I wouldn't just intervene politically into this procedure. And uh, it is also mentioned that the certies with our family policy. I, I, what do I you, said, what do I you said, mean? I, I, Commentators said this sounded, sounds like uh, the premiums uh, that were given by the Nazi government in Germany to I for childbearing and so on. That it smacks, and, and, and I said this is the totally wrong analogy, and it's the sovereign right of the Hungarian government. Uh, but there, there was mentioned this. the 30s and the Nazis, so I don't know what. No, I, I, no I, 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 I remember that he said that it's something the commentator said that... It I, I, I totally, I, I totally refuted I refu uh, it. I, I gave that as one example of a debate that has gone out of control. Also, the Hungarian opposition wasn't very smart responding to, to these... Yeah, because... Uh, uh, you should just say, okay, uh, Hungarian women can accept to take this or... Not, but it's not, not about Hungarian women, it's about the, the family policy, what we are striving for, because... Let's, let's maybe not anyway. get into this issue, because we... But we uh, you, got, you got me wrong... I'm uh, sorry. Got, I'm sorry if me I wrong there, wrong. I would have never, no. Because uh, I, I hear it everywhere in the international press, like the 30s, and when you are once blamed with this, it's, it's you know, it's not easy to uh, uh, make it clear, but uh, it's about supporting families and not about women's rights whatsoever, so, and not about some kind of engineering. I, I would like to talk about um, one, one last campaign before we open it up to the floor. I would like to ask um, about the campaign um, about Soros, I, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't find the answer about why um, the Hungarian government is, actually does care so much about George Soros. Maybe, maybe you um, will find an answer to that just in a second, but I would also like to ask you about um, the latest campaign of last week um, that I mentioned in my introduction. And I would like to ask you, in terms of procedure, is how does it actually work um, when a campaign like this is designed? Who has the idea and who uh, comes up with such a campaign and who is part of this? Were you, were you a part of the, whole, uh, of the whole drafting of this campaign? What or question. to what extent were you included? And, and what exactly is the rationale behind it? Can, it's just, I, th I think there are many misunderstandings in this room and I, I would like to understand that. Okay, I'm working as a state secretary, so I'm doing my job taking part in panel discussions like this and uh, <laughs> traveling to the capitals and uh, especially dealing with Article 7 procedure. So this is my job and uh, the Article 7 procedure has many, many legal failures because there was also a question and I just had no chance to answer it. So uh, the Financial Times last year actually elected or granted Mr. Soros the Man of the Year uh, prize. I think it's very helpful in, in uh, explaining the situation because he's a financial businessman. And uh, the Financial Times said that he's making his own foreign policy. So how can it come that a, a financial, a businessman is making a foreign policy instead of democratically elected governments in Europe? He had more meetings with commissioners, even with Mr. Juncker, uh, than any other head of state in the European Union. 
So I think this is, this is very, very important fact to consider. And uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, this legislative package, uh, there is only the transparency issue uh, to ask NGOs and civil society organizations to declare the source of funding, which is an average practice in the European Union. Many parliamentarians and also the big liberals and the, the Greens are fighting for the fullest possible transparency when it comes to uh, the fact of funding of the lobby organizations around Brussels and also concerning... Why, why, why didn't you call it NGO transparency and, uh, no, and you chose to call it Stop Soros? Um, there, there is a certain obsession. I mean, he may have gotten this man of the year, not for his foreign policy, actually, because he was, he, with his legacy, he stands up for the values of open society, which are under threat uh, in Germany and uh, across Europe and beyond, uh, beyond Europe. That's why he got the man of the year, uh, yeah, but man of the year award. Uh, why don't you call the legislative package NGO, civil society transparency law? Why do you call it Stop Soros? But actually, you, you, you said it right, that he, he uh, was declared to be a successful businessman doing his own foreign policy, and he declared uh, in his studies, and I myself uh, witnessed when I was in the European Parliament, and he gave his presentation about how he thinks about European migration policy. And actually, the European Commission is just executing this kind of uh, project. It means inviting and uh, people outside of Europe to get into Europe and provide more funding for that. So it is, it is highly interlinked with the migration policy. Maybe we, can, we can talk about uh, what the European Commission actually does on, on migration. It does not, not, none of the things that uh, you allege it, uh, it does in terms of executing some se uh, secret or not so secret plan by Mr. Soros. Actually, the European Commission in the European Union, they spend a lot of money on, on beefing up border security, which is a common concern of both uh, Germany and, and Hungary. And the European Commission cannot invite foreigners uh, to come. A uh, humanitarian visa, for example, can only grant, be granted by, by member states. Even Hungary grants humanitarian uh, visa, and you invite citizens, citizens from, from certain countries, uh, refugees uh, in. But that's not being done by the European Commission. So th these whole images that get conjured up, that uh, there's this kind of awful European Commission sitting somewhere and Mr. Juncker and behind him Mr. Soros, uh, who met him so many times uh, and kind of instilled these ideas into the brain of, uh, of Mr. Juncker, who then executed this plan to get all these migrants from all over the world to Hungary. That's a joke. It's a bad joke. It's, it's a bunch of lies that you sell to your population in order, in order to in order to divert from the other issues uh, that, uh, that they care about, uh, whether the hospitals uh, run well, uh, whether, whether there's enough teachers uh, and all the other social issues that uh, ordinary people would care about. If, but if you feel constantly under threat in your cultural identity and think there's this kind of Jewish fi finance man who wants to shove down Muslims uh, into your country, you feel under, under attack all the time and you focus on that in your public discussion. And that's, uh, that's the method that Mr. Orban uses. Uh, with, and, and he spends taxpayer money on this. Uh, not but only that, did he do the billboards, but now he prepared this letter that he sends to every Hungarian citizen that repeats all these lies uh, that you see on the billboards. Let me ask lies. you what... Just in, in one or two sentences, what is the goal of the whole campaign? To make uh, it clear what it's about in Brussels, what's going on. I've been working in these institutions for nine years, so I know that all these which are written in the campaign are all true, even if uh, they already the, the harsh uh, reaction, it's a proof itself that the truth hurts. Just to give you an example, this is uh, from the side of... Uh, uh, the European Commission, the European institution, especially the European Parliament, there is a, an ongoing attempt not to stop migration, but to manage migration, to manage, which, is a, which means that they have a setting up a mechanism for the quota. The quota itself, it's an invitation card, because it implies that there are always room here for those who want to, want to uh, uh, enter Europe. And if you, if you look at this from this angle, it is, it is crystal clear that uh, the policies in Brussels are diverting or are, are, are directing uh, into embracing migration and as a positive issue. 
We don't accept this. And when there was a consensus, or there was a consensus needed back in 2015 to, and 16 to decide on the quota, Hungary was sitting at the table, as, as Mr. Juncker said, that you are sitting at the table, what are you talking about? Yes, exactly, this is the point. We were sitting there, but we were overruled. Mm -hmm. Because instead of striving for a consensus in the quota issue, Hungary was actually, and some other countries who were opposing the quota, they were circumvented with a qualified majority decision. And Hungary actually is sued in the court of justice for not complying with this uh, quota. So what we are talking about is reality. And the quota is still on the table, and it is still in the draft. So look, look at the latest version of the European Parliament's uh, position. So uh, that's why we do believe that uh, uh, these elections will be very, very important because they will completely redesign the political landscape in Europe. And we do believe that in the next European Parliament, the anti-migration uh, political parties will gain majority. And then subsequently also in the European institutions, in the European Commission, and later on in subsequent national elections in the European Council. Because this is our uh, uh, aim and objective. Thank you very much. I, I will leave it at that because I would like to leave some time for questions from the audience. Liebe Gäste, wir haben nicht mehr allzu viel Zeit, aber ich möchte Ihnen die Möglichkeit geben, auch die ein oder andere Frage zu stellen. Bitte halten Sie sich sehr kurz und achten Sie darauf, dass es kein Statement wird, sondern eine kurze und prägnante Frage. Wir fangen da hinten mit der ersten Frage an. Können Sie ganz kurz auf das Mikrofon noch warten? Guten Abend, ich heiße Ferenc Horvath, ich lebe in Hamburg seit 30 Jahren. Ich habe sehr äh, interess interessant zugehört, interessiert zugehört, was Herr Benner eben über Ungarn erzählt hatte und über die Liebe zu Land Ungarn. Ich möchte Herrn Benner ein bisschen darauf hinweisen, wo er diese Information, dass in Ungarn 90 Prozent der Medien zu Herrn Orban gehört, genommen hatte. Wenn er in Ungarn eigentlich gelebt hatte und Ungarn kennt, dann weiß er es ganz genau, wenn er vor einem Zeitungsstand steht in Budapest, da ungefähr 60 Prozent des Zeitungsstandes sind liberale Medien und ungefähr 40 Prozent christliche Medien. Wenn man eigentlich die Radiosender oder die Internetwebseite nimmt, dann ist der, dieses Verhältnis genauso. Wenn, wenn Sie auf der Universität eigentlich gelehrt hatten, dann hätten Sie das bitte wissen müssen. Und das ist das Problem. Das ist das Problem mit Darf Ihnen, ich Sie um Ihnen, das Fragezeichen am Ende bitten? Ja, Ach. aber das ist das Problem, dass Herr Benner sämtliche solche Sachen von sich gibt und Frau Varga nicht mal die Zeit hat, um das zu... Das ist eine akkusative, akkusative Verhör. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank für den Kommentar. Die Frage war jetzt nicht dabei. Ich möchte Sie bitten, eine Frage tatsächlich zu stellen. Und wir werden... Woher stammt die Information? Okay. Die Frage nach der Quelle, ähm, woher Sie die These nehmen. Ich, ich weiß nicht, in welchem New York Times Artikel ich das, das gelesen habe. Aber, aber das ist gerade der Punkt. Ich war länger nicht an dem Zeitungsstand in, in Budapest, aber es gibt keine regierungskritische Tageszeitung mehr. Die, die, Erlebt es aber. Ne? Und, und, äh, und die, Regier die Regierung hat gerade und es kartellrechtlich durchgeprügelt äh, diese neue Stiftung aufgesetzt, äh, die eine riesige Zahl von Medientiteln vereint, äh, die von einem getreuen von Herrn Orban geführt wird äh, und diese Medientitel auf Linie bringen wird. Es gibt, es gibt eine gewisse Pluralität äh, im Fernsehbereich und da müssen wir, wir haben, ich habe sehr schlecht über einige deutsche Unternehmen gesprochen, wir müssen sehr gut reden über Bertelsmann, weil Bertelsmann hat es trotz Riesendrucks bislang vermieden, RTL Club, den Fernsehsender, den, den sie haben, zu verkaufen. Es gab viele Avancen von, von Seiten der Orban-Regierung und befreundeter Oligarchen, 
denen das ein Dorn im Auge ist. Sie haben auch eine Sondersteuer widerstanden, die die Orban-Regierung auf RTL Club äh, erhoben hat und gesagt hat, wir bleiben dabei und RTL Club äh, berichtet weiterhin unabhängig. Ob es jetzt nur 90 Prozent sind oder 85 Prozent, die Konzentration im Medienmarkt äh, und das, was sie auch aus, aushalten müssen als äh, Oppositionspartei an Schmähkampagnen. Äh, ich kenne einige, die in, bei Momentum organisiert sind, dieser neuen Partei und äh, wo dann in, in, diesen, in diesen regierungsnahen Blättern gefüttert teilweise durch, durch Behörden irgendwelche Stories erscheinen, die, die, die diese neue Partei als korrupt darstellen, darstellen soll. Und das müssen Sie wenn, Sie, wenn Sie als junger Mensch, und Momentum ist eine Partei, die von jungen Aktivisten gegründet worden ist, das sind alles sehr gut ausgebildete, größtenteils, die eigentlich irgendwo arbeiten könnten in Europa und sagen halt, es ist mir alles zu viel, äh, Politik zu machen in, in Orbans illiberalem Staat. Aber die sagen, ich möchte dafür kämpfen, äh, dass wir die Demokratie, die liberale Demokratie in, in Ungarn zurück gewinnen, dass die junge Generation eine Zukunft hat. Und diese jungen Politiker sagen mir, dass die Analogien, die sie ziehen, die werden zwar unterstützt von ALDE und, und bekommen da Trainings, aber sie sagen, ich schaue mir eigentlich eher an, wie es damals war bei Milosevic in, in Serbien, wie, wie da Oppositionsparteien Politik gemacht haben, weil die Analogie ist viel besser dazu, zu den, zu den Bedingungen, die andere Oppositionsparteien in Europa, in anderen Ländern der Europäischen Union vorfinden. Ich kann nur sagen, was, was diese jungen Politiker mir, die meiner Ansicht nach sehr idealistisch sind, weil die haben keine Aussicht darauf, morgen an den Geldtöpfen und den, den großen, großen politischen Machtapparaten zu stehen, sondern die glauben an ein Ideal, dass es eine andere, eine, eine bessere Gesellschaft und eine Rückgewinnung der liberalen Demokratie in Ungarn geben kann und eine positive europäische, positive europäische Vision aus, aus Ungarn hinaus. Und wenn das mir diese jungen Aktivisten oder Politiker sagen, dann äh, muss, ich, muss ich dem und die, die Medienlandschaft, die sie vor sich, vor sich sehen, äh, dann muss ich dem Glauben schenken. Uh. May I just come in? Um, yes, please. of course. Uh, Hungary is a living democracy, so the opposition has all the all the tools, uh, legal tools, to fight for their uh, opinion. So uh, they can freely operate, uh, abiding by the laws. And when it comes to the media, uh, uh, let me tell you that the most important thing is uh, the excess uh, ratio. And it is a clear fact that the the big majority of the Hungarian media, be it television, radio online, uh, it is, uh, ex the access rate is so high towards the highly government critical liberal media that everybody can write about everything in Hungary. There is a freedom of expression, freedom of speech. So when, when I'm, I'm reading about uh, Hungary uh, in the Le Soir on Le Monde, as if there wouldn't be any kind of freedom of speech because the media, the liberal media is oppressed, I, I, have, no, to, there's, there's I have to laugh. Of, there's freedom of speech, but how do you explain that the US aid, the development agency of the US government, they put up a program that they stopped later uh, uh, due to political pressure from the Hungarian government that was supposed to, to support independent local journalism in Hungary as a USAID program to set up independent local journalism because they said there's a dearth of fact-based independent local journalism in Hungary because in, in, for local media, the, uh, the government uh, controls almost all the media what available. What did they do, the, the American aid, what did they do? They, they, they put out a tender for capacity building programs to support independent local journalism in Hungary. And that wasn't done in some, some uh, usually you would do that in a non-democracy uh, to, to do that where, you, where you, you want to support this, but it was done by the American government to support independent fact-based local journalism in Hungary because they thought there wasn't enough of that. You know, it also shows that Hungary uh, allows all kind of democratical activity in Hungary, so they can do it. And uh, you just said uh, before as an answer that you read it in somewhere in the New York Times. So this, uh, this yeah, is highly Donald Trump, based. Donald Trump wouldn't be happy about it. Yeah. We have, you know. But look, they, they, everybody is free in Hungary to uh, 
how to say, carry out activities what they want in the framework of the laws. So this is, sorry. We have one more question from the back. Ja, mein Name ist Gustav Lünenburg, Vorstaatssekretärin. Demokratie ist natürlich nicht beliebig. Wir haben uns vor längerer Zeit in der europäischen Verfassung auf eine Demokratiegrundformel geeinigt, die von der Gewaltenteilung spricht. Und diese ist nach meiner Beurteilung als politisch Interessierter seit Jahrzehnten in Ungarn. Und da schließe ich mich den Anfangsargumenten von Herrn Benner gerne an ganz erheblich nicht realisiert. Aber meine Frage ist eine andere. Sie können uns sicherlich erklären, weshalb der so ungeheuer geduldige Kommissionspräsident Juncker in diesen Tagen, wie Frau von Hammerstein uns noch mal sagte, den Ausschluss von Fidesz aus den äh, Volksparteien Europas beschlossen hat, denn das ist ja ein einmaliger Akt, der, glaube ich, noch nie da gewesen ist und ist ja geradezu dramatisch. Was sind aus Ihrer Sicht die Gründe, dass dieser Spitzenpolitiker Europas die Fidesz ausschließen will? If, uh, the end of the sentence was well, so what are the main reasons that uh, Jean-Claude Juncker wants to exclude Fidesz from the European People's Party? And if I may add, I would like, because we want to look into the future at least a little bit, we haven't had time enough for that. Um, so I would like to ask you about um, if that actually happens, and we don't know whether, whether Fidesz will be excluded from the European People's Party, is that something that um, the government would like, or is it something that um, would be a, the, the worst case scenario? And what would be the plan B for, for after the European Parliament elections in May? I think it's a party political question, so a state secretary is not the right person to answer this. But as I already said, the Fidesz is working for the success of the EPP, and now we are in the campaign, so we should be united because uh, uh, Europe is facing a lot of challenges in the future and instead of uh, a politician like Mr. Juncker, instead of dividing the family, he should concentrate on the unity uh, for the sake of the whole success because that drives the forces uh, of the left uh, uh, wing uh, politicians in Europe because we are in the campaigning mood. And uh, I would like to highlight that this was not the first time that Juncker mentioned this idea. It was already mentioned before by him. And he is actually referring to Christian democracy uh, as if Fidesz wouldn't be a Christian party, but he is who actually praising uh, Fidel Castro and who is his uh, Kranze, uh, the, uh, the statue of Marx, of Karl Marx. You may also all uh, remember these remarkable moments in European history when uh, a People's Party politician, the head of the European Commission is actually referring to the heritage of Marx as something good thing in Europe, which still, uh, uh, triggers a lot of very, very bad memories and emotions in many, many generations who live still in Europe. So I think we should also uh, talk about this uh, uh, line of Mr. Juncker. I have another question here in the second row. Just one second until the microphone is there. Ich frage mich, wie eine Organisation mit einem Maximum an Demokratiedefizit wie die EU anderen Staaten Lektionen in Sachen Demokratie erteilen kann. Und ähm, ich frage mich auch, ähm, ist äh, die alleinige Deutungshoheit in Sachen Demokratie äh, bei den Linksliberalen? Danke. Das habe ich nicht verstanden. Um, if, if you could, who, who are you, an wen haben Sie die Frage gerichtet? Thorsten Benner, wollen Sie anfangen und dann gehen wir weiter? Was war die Frage? The, the question was whether a fundamentally undemocratic institution such as the EU, how it can kind of lecture anybody on what democracy is and whether democracy is just this kind of left uh, liberal kind of thing or whether there's some, I don't know, different form of... Uh, of uh, of democracy. All I can say is that it's not about the EU lecturing anybody. If anything, it has been wrong on the, on the part of the, the member states to always defer to the commission and to the bidding, because ultimately it's a political struggle we need to have within the party families and uh, between the, the member governments of the European Union, all are democratically elected uh, to kind of uh, 
argue our differences. Oftentimes, we hide behind the commission and let the commission do the kind of dirty work, and then the commission like goes and uh, then uh, Hungary or Poland or anybody else who kind of isn't an infringement thing walks a little bit back and, and, and so on, much rather than the heads of government to actually standing and discussing, discussing this. So in, in our context, it would be Mrs. Merkel's job to actually explain whether she is in line with the liberal state vision of uh, Mr. Orban and to, to actually have a discussion with him in private, but also publicly with the German public, with the European public, on, on how she actually sees uh, European democracy. I, I don't think uh, anybody implied uh, that uh, we want some left uh, liberal version of uh, democracy. I think that's uh, the, the line you oftentimes hear also in, in Germany with, with those who want to discredit uh, Rechtsstaat uh, and uh, liberale Demokratie. By, by saying it's this kind of links grün versifft uh, kind of heritage that we need to get rid of. I don't associate uh, with these kind of positions. I, need, I think we need to have a reasoned debate, uh, as Mr. Steinmeier said, entweder die Demokratie ist liberal und sozial und föderal oder sie ist, uh, oder sie ist nicht. And we need to have this debate not just in Germany, but uh, within Europe, and we need to have it because the Hungarian Prime Minister sits in Brussels at the table and makes decisions that also affect the lives of German citizens, and, uh, if, uh, and that's why we also need to worry about each other's states of democracy, because we are interdep interdependent. The choices that our heads of government make that uh, affect all our lives, uh, and we need to take an interest in the kind of democratic lives of our neighbors. And you can do the same uh, with us. If you, uh, if you think uh, some things are going wrong in, in German democracy and uh, we don't up up uphold certain principles we should be upholding within the European Union, then tell us. Uh, Germany should be open to that criticism like any other member state, and we need to have an honest and open debate among the heads of states, across the societies, and don't, we shouldn't just push it to the European Commission or even the European uh, or overload uh, courts uh, with this because courts then also easily get uh, politicized. And what happens if the Polish government, for example, if there, there's a European court of, just, uh, court of Justice ruling and the Polish government just says, we won't follow uh, on a rule of law issue. Where do, you know, where, where do we end up? So this is a political fight and discussion we need to have across societies, across member governments, uh, and uh, we need to have it openly and urgently. Mrs. Vaga, I would like to give you the floor for that final comment question and also ask you, because we just did not have enough time to talk about the future, I asked you about, um, at the beginning, I asked you about um, Hungary and the European Union and how you would describe the relationship as it is right now. And I would like to ask you if in three words you could describe the future relationship of <laughs> Hungary and the European Union. How do you envisage the relationship to be? Where, how do you want the European Union to be from a Hungarian perspective? I, I see a European Union which uh, is uh, proud of the achievements and preserves uh, the achievements of the integration. So it means that uh, we keep the leading role of the European Council because these are primarily those bodies who were elected in the name of rule of law as a result of democratic elections. So primarily the heads of states are there to decide on future strategies and the way forward. The commission must uh, remain the guardian of the treaties. And uh, as regards the, the relationship between member states, we ask for a mutual respect. Respect the differences, respect uh, a member state if it uses in the name of rule of law and also in the framework of rule of law because it's it's like water and air in every member state. This is uh, the basic of our functioning in Europe, that uh, we have different methods, different recipes to the challenges, but just not walking the same path what the mainstream is walking in Europe, be it about migration or be it about anything else, then just we ask for certain uh, liberal thinking to be open enough uh, uh, 
to, to understand what we are trying to, to uh, strive for. And uh, of course, the subsidiarity principle, it's very, very important, the respect of the national competences, which are clearly written in the treaty. We don't have to invent the wheel. Everything is written down. And uh, as regards Article 7 procedure, what I see, it is actually acting against the cohesion among member states. It raises a lot of mistrust. Already the atmosphere in the council is very, very spoiled, very, very awful. And uh, when uh, member states are, are just uh, uh, starting to name and shame each other because uh, they don't understand really each other, then that may just uh, act against the whole uh, project. So it is, it, is a, it is a very, very bad experience what we are experiencing thanks to this Article 7 procedure. And, uh, it will spoil also the bilateral uh, relations. And uh, we should be very careful because you mentioned just the administrative court system as, again, some, some bad things happening in Hungary. Let me say that Hungary had an administrative court system, a separate one, before the communist regime in 49. The communists actually abolished. Now what we are doing is getting back to our historic heritage and we are using the Austrian model. And also in Germany and other member states, we have administrative court systems. So why is, is Hungary again the black sheep? And if we say, okay, let's criticize us, but then it should be a real peer review, meaning that if I'm criticizing one institution in a member state, then I put all the 27 different uh, types of solutions in this institution, and then I have a comparison. We can do it. Let's in do it. The of fundamental rights, for example, in Vienna, they could do this kind this of democracy is audit list. in a period. Ladies view. and gentlemen, I'm, I'm very this sorry. Is, this is I need EU. to Another interrupt you States. here. There's much to discuss. We could go on for hours, but I yes. want to thank both of you for a very respectful debate and, and a very open debate. Thank you. Very and much. I would like to invite you to come back. We at Kerber Foundation, we will continue the dialogue on the future of the European project and I'm very happy that you Mrs. Varga will also join us in Budapest for the Burgdorf Roundtable to continue exactly this debate. So on this note thank you very much to both of you for coming here and thank you for, to you for listening and I would like to invite all of you for a glass of water or a glass of wine outside on behalf of Kerber <laughs> Foundation. Thank you. Yeah, no.